Hello and welcome back to Climbing on Mount Sophia. In this adventure, I'm joined by Seth Taylor. Seth's work has been deeply helpful for me in my journey, and he exemplifies tremendous courage, honesty, and openness in his attempts at climbing the mountain. In this conversation, we explore around ideas of consciousness, working through trauma, both collective and individual, and the psychedelic medicines. As always, feedback and comments are greatly appreciated. Thank you for joining. Thanks for coming to talk to me. I really appreciate it. Absolutely. Um, we haven't met before, although I've met your brother a few times, and he's yeah. had, uh, he's had a lot of positive impact on me. But both of you um, showed up in my life at a time that I really needed some help. Um, you had you had both written this book, Feels Like Redemption, together. Yes, yes, yeah. um, and it was very instrumental in helping to open me up to maybe a dimension of myself and reality that I wasn't able to access before. Uh. Um, and it was kind of the first piece in opening me up to that. And one of the ways to maybe start to talk about that aspect is this word consciousness. Mm -hmm. um, and so I kind of, the direction I'd like to go in this conversation is talking about consciousness and then some aspects of what we mean by that word and how it connects to some of the the status quo of where we've been and mm -hmm. maybe the future horizons of where we might be going yeah. um, as kind of uh, as human beings. So maybe first, what what are we talking about when we're talking about consciousness and um, are there, are there levels and gradients within that? How do you look at this whole idea of consciousness? Yeah. Wow, man, that's, that is a question. That is a huge, huge <laughs> question. Cause you're, you're talking about, you're talking about probably what someone called the primary open question in science, right? What is consciousness? We know it is, we know consciousness exists, but in scientifically, we don't really know what makes it or whatever. But, but if you tap into the ancient traditions, of course, we have a lot to say about it. Right. Um, but consciousness from a, a, what is consciousness? Consciousness is the observer. It's the ability to exist, right? It is our existence. And we know it exists on a scientific level because we have the capacity to observe everything. So we know that your thoughts are not consciousness. Your thoughts are just your thoughts. Your feelings are your feelings. Your body is your body. All of this is, is yours, but it's not you. And the reason we know that is because we have the capacity to observe it. If you can observe your thoughts, you are not your thoughts. If you can observe your feelings, you are not your feelings. If you can observe your body, you are not your body. You can observe your emotion, you're not your emotion. So we know that that is what consciousness is. Now, the old term, the ancient term, they would use the term soul. Mm. But soul, it would be referred to as an individual consciousness. And then we begin to talk about the levels of consciousness, which means expanding into greater and greater levels, because there seems to be consciousness beyond the, own, the soul that can be participated in. And so ultimately... When you, when you a, science, a quantum physicist talks about consciousness, the ancient term for that would be God. Mm. Right? The old term would be God. So when consciousness is basically the universe reflecting upon itself. It's like looking in a mirror. So um, there are, you know, in, in a lot of the old traditions, the Vedanta tradition, like in the Hindu, like the old, that's the oldest stuff, right? The, uh, well, the oldest that, that was written down, at least. You know, we know of. Yeah, the, they were referring to, they, they refer to levels of consciousness. For them, they have seven levels. You know, they have the three lower levels and the four higher levels. So there's the three levels. They talk about deep sleep, dream state, waking state, and then they go into what's called soul consciousness, then cosmic consciousness, then divine consciousness, and then what ultimately they call unity consciousness. And unity consciousness is you hear reflected in the words of Jesus when he says, I and the Father are one. Like there's a perception, there's an understanding that the universe is me in me as much as I am in it, mm -hmm. but I'm also an individual. So it's to be able to hold both at once. And it's not something that can be understood. The levels of consciousness are not really things that can be understood without participating in them, actually experiencing mm -hmm. them, mm -hmm. um, which, you know, when now we can get into the rise of the psychedelics and, mm -hmm. and, and the spiritual movement and all this kind of stuff. And it, it's a, it, it is, that's, that's probably the best way I could sum it up in a. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, that's a, that's an amazing summation. And in, in yeah. terms of, I mean, obviously, like you said, it's an incredibly difficult thing to even start to approach. Right. Um, one of the things that, so you use the word participate several times Yeah. and, um, I'm doing a lot of my interest in time and, um, I don't know, 
I, I tell people a lot, <clears throat> I work in medicine and I tell people that I'm working with in medicine. I say, I do medicine to support a philosophy passion. Mm -hmm. And I've been doing a lot of um, reading and work around some of the work of a guy named John Verveke. Have you heard that mm -hmm. name? I have not. No. So he's a cognitive scientist and a philosopher at the University of Toronto. Oh. And he's, you know, there's there's one way of getting at this that is like you're talking about through the old traditions, through the spirituality, through the religious mm -hmm. traditions. And he does some of that, but he primarily comes at it from the side of science and cognitive science and philosophy and working, like digging down more so than going down and digging up. If yeah. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> so he talks about in cognitive science, they have this thing called the four p's of knowing so there's four levels at which you know a thing mm -hmm. so the top level is the propositional and it's words it's knowing the semantic words about something mm -hmm. and then you have the next level is the um the procedural and it's knowing how to do something you can't mm -hmm. quite contain and each level can't be contained in the one above it right so it's like a pyramid <clears throat> and so it's higher higher resolution data compression, something like that. Mm. And so then you have the procedural and you have the perspectival, which is what it feels like to be somewhere. And then you have the bottom level, which is the participatory. And that is knowing a thing by being a part of it and by mm. it being a part of you. So the, the analogy for this is like a marriage in this, in the sense that I know myself Mm -hmm. because i know my wife we know each other in this way that we wouldn't know our own selves without right. that participating participation right. right is reflecting back upon you yeah you're about to enter into a new level of that right you, you know you're having a kid in six months well and it's funny because my wife and i call it kid consciousness you know you have friends that are parents and friends that aren't right and you and kid consciousness is a thing once you become a parent you start to become much it's a really profound mirror right you're yeah. talking about a mirror right so that's, that's the thing. Cause right now, if like, if I was talk if I started talking about all the struggles of parenthood, you'd be like, yeah, we have a dog and you know, and that's like, you know, that's like you end up in everybody's talking about their nieces and nephews or something like that. And you're just like, yeah, they, they don't understand because you can't, you can't until yeah, you, yeah. It, it awakens something inside you. The first time you hold your child, you're going to be like, oh man, <laughs> there's something coming inside me. There's a new thing because your future goes boom like this and your life goes and all of a sudden all your, all the stuff that you have buried deep inside you is going to start to bubble to the surface. And then there's, it's a, it, yeah, that's the thing. And these are, of course, are the events that cause consciousness. The event that it is trying to get, grasp the physics of it is a really fun thing. I think, I think it's really interesting when you listen to guys like what you're talking about trying to grasp those things because you can come at it it's all language right you can come at it from a philosophical standpoint you can come at it from a brain science standpoint you can come at it from an ancient spirituality from a quantum physics from all these different spaces and it's super fun because we're all talking about the same thing we're all trying to describe this thing which is which is very uh scripture like right you read the text the old text you know the vedanta you know stuff the, the tao Te ching or you know and then and the, the jewish text and the christian text and, the, and all of that and you're all just trying to describe this experience yeah. and using different forms of language and it's absolutely fascinating absolutely fascinating i love it so interesting man so one of the so to go off of that like one of the things that i think how I might, might characterize the way that we are held back from collectively kind of recognizing that space and mm -hmm. being able to transcend maybe say that the lower levels of consciousness, which it seems many of us are trapped in, mm -hmm. has to do with um, something called the, the tyranny of the propositional. In this taking that propositional level of understanding reality, of being in the world of consciousness in a, in a sense, and projecting that such that mm -hmm. it becomes it becomes the primary authority yeah. of what is real and that that disconnects us from right. from actually being in the space of you know you call it flow state or pure consciousness and those kinds of things sure um now that you do a lot of work as far as i understand most of your time is spent working with individuals Mm -hmm. who are who are wanting to move out of spaces where they may be stuck in their own lives yeah what does that look like for you 
Yeah. And, and, and applying it to what you just said, I actually funny. It's cause I just got a new client this morning. He texts me and he's like, I'm really, really stuck. I just feel stuck and unmotivated. Cause he's like, what's the, what's the work look like? I said, well, I'm going to teach you a lot of stuff. I'll give you a little bit of homework. He's like, Oh, homework. Is it a lot? And I go, no, but it's important. He's like, cause I just have a hard time doing anything. I just so stuck. I'm like, yeah, we're going to get you unstuck, man. It's okay. <laughs> but what it, what it looks like. Cause you are ultimately what these questions you're asking, you are, you are working with someone living at a certain state of consciousness and you have to work within that state of consciousness in order to transcend to the next state of consciousness. Right. And that's the whole goal with everyone is to get them out of that waking state of consciousness. Or some people call it the zombie, the zombie consciousness. Yeah, right. Yeah. You know, I think it sounds like you've read some Peter Rollins or, or yeah. Or, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Cause it's slab boy, Zizek, guys like that. The, you have to, you're working to, get them from this one state to the next state, but you have to meet them where they are with that. And then you have to understand that you're not just dealing with thought mm. thought. Ultimately thought is, is an ego. It's the ego. Mm. It's an ego structure, you know, to use the psychology term, the ego structure is meant to actually hold the level of consciousness. And, and, and most people live in a kind of a survival state. We survive this level of consciousness and we define it through the stories we tell mm. So the, the angle I go at it from is recognizing that we live in these states of consciousness in order to survive what we carry subconsciously. And that's the mm -hmm. thing. This is where the human, the human capacity and the ego's capacity on this material plane or the third dimensional plane, we call it, its capacity to, to survive in this depends on its ability to compartmentalize and suppress trauma. Mm -hmm. And so for me, it's all about trauma. And, and that's, of course, not everything. It's about our relationship with the ego, how that develops, how that changes, its control over our lives. But it's about being able to deal with the subconscious and how it's found in so many complex layers mm -hmm. that, I mean, because it is, it's just, it, I mean, it has, it has pathways into, you know, our ancestral lines and our DNA and our, and our past lives. And, and if, you know, if you go for that kind of thing and, and in the, of course, in this current life as well. You know, I work with a lot of professional athletes, like we work into how their subconscious repressed stuff is showing up on the field in their current life. And and yeah. so it's about finding pathways into that and then giving people the tools and understanding of how to actually heal that. Um, and if we do that, then what you see is consciousness expands very naturally. Mm -hmm. People's consciousness start to expand. People go, holy cow, they have these experiences. And then all of a sudden they start to see things differently. Like, I don't know, like I had this client text me this morning. She goes, I don't know why, but it's just all, it all looks different. Mm -hmm. Like, right. Yeah. You're just yeah. waking up and seeing something different. And that can get a little scary, of course, because the ego starts losing its grip. And when the ego loses its grip, there's a process that starts taking place as some would call the path to enlightenment, but it's, it starts taking place and it starts expanding on you pretty quickly. So for me, there's one quote that kind of started it all for me um, by a, I think it's 12th or 13th century Christian mystic, a guy named Meister Eckhart. Oh yeah. I love yeah, you know, you know Eckhart? Oh, yeah, he's, yeah, deeply. Yeah. <laughs> I know yeah. deeply yeah. And he's, he says the kingdom of God, which was the Christian way of, of understanding the soul within, right? Yeah. He said the kingdom of God is not found in the human soul by a process of addition, but by subtraction. Mm -hmm. And for me, that's kind of, that is, that probably sums up the pivot point for all the work I do. Mm -hmm. What I'm trying to do is go in and recognize that this person is, is not made by God. They're made of God. Mm -hmm. Right. And all we have to do is begin to subtract everything within them that's blocking their perspective, their ability to not only see that and know that, but to be able to experience it on a daily basis. And that's what consciousness is. So we start pulling back the veil, pulling back the blinders, pulling back the trauma, removing that stuff from the system. The system realigns and begins to expand. And one day they say, I was blind, but now I see. That's what you see this it's just this, you know, I love the image in this, in the new Testament when it talks about this, this scales falling from your eyes. Yes. Yes. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. what, and that's what consciousness is. Now, unfortunately the mind, the, the ego has the capacity to, to even, you know, turn those into a proposition. It can turn the truth of the expansion of consciousness and, and turn it into a proposition, make it into knowledge. Mm -hmm. right? The ego seeks to understand these things as in, in thought structures where consciousness is not a thought structure. It's an experience. That's why people that are more enlightened tend to be pretty quiet, you know, because they, they don't have to think, they don't have to structure it. They don't have to explain it. They can just experience it. And it, and it feels more and more and more like what we, we just call love, Yeah, you know, which is the ultimate goal. Nobody, nobody, ultimately, nobody really is like concerned with their life circumstances, but ultimately they just want to feel good. Yeah. You know, if so, you know, if somebody wakes up in the ghetto in a horrible, you know, drives a crappy car and, and lives in a terrible house and doesn't make a lot of money, but they wake up every morning going, Oh, I just feel good. 
<laughs> they just yeah. and they just live in gratitude. They're not that concerned. And then they can get creative. Of course, then abundance starts to flow because oh, there's all this space inside you to get creative and do all kinds of fun stuff. But but if that's really what people want. So when people come to me, no matter, I got a guy right now, it's worth hundred million. And I got people that are just like, I can't, I can't afford you, but, but, but I, I had this guy come to me. He's like, I, I can teach martial arts. And I'm like, Oh, okay. My son wants to learn martial arts. You teach him and I'll teach you. Okay. And he's like, yeah, we do that. So, <laughs> like, yeah. And, and yeah. but no matter what, no matter who they are, they're coming from this place where they're going, I just want to wake up. Why do I wake up every morning and just not, not okay. Not yeah. okay with myself and not okay with who my life is. This guy's like, this guy is like, when I drive my Ferrari on the track, I just, I like it, but I just feel terrible. <laughs> and that's no, you know what I mean? That's no different than the the guy that's going, why can't I make money? You know? Yeah. Well, there's a way in which like what we're, what we're facing now, just kind of in the world in general is, is this it's been called a meaning crisis. Mm -hmm. if we have a crisis of what makes things meaningful. We have a, we have a, an, an overabundance of all the things we thought would make us happy. Right, the the, yeah. the classical modern dream of having plenty, um, getting to do whatever you want, getting to drive that Ferrari on the racetrack, getting to have four houses, whatever. Yeah, and that's really like that's it, right? That's the penultimate, and yeah. then, and then here we are, and there's this great line. I haven't, I read it, I read this quote. I haven't watched the series. It's a Count Dracula series on Netflix or something, but Count Dracula like wakes up in some lower middle class woman's house in outskirts of London or something and he's been asleep for 400 years and he wakes up in her house and he's looking around and he's like oh my gosh like are you are you the, the queen of this place like this is amazing I've never seen anything like this yeah. and she's like no I'm not I'm not wealthy at all and he says I've been at something I've been sucking the blood or something of kings and queens for a thousand years and I've never seen luxury like I see it now mm. and he says this great quote I knew the future would bring wonders I just didn't know it would make them ordinary <laughs> that's great <laughs> that's so we great. live in this world where we have all this stuff right we have all yeah. this yeah the goals have been achieved and yet for us, have, yeah, for for the for white Americans, yes, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Well, and just you know the the ancient dream of the Renaissance or whatever, right, mm -hmm. of modernity, right. and it's like that's not it. It's not mm -hmm. it, man. Like we went sideways somewhere, and so yeah. then now we have to figure it out. Yeah. So one of the one of the central aspects of, I mean, they're all language models, right? But the language sure. model that I speak from mostly is this kind of crossover between. Um, like neoplatonism and christianity and mm -hmm. I, there's there's quite a few layers of eastern stuff in there as well ram das yeah. has been a huge influence on me um and but what's come out of it is something like a constraint feedback model of how yeah. reality works yeah that we we so like something like i'm awareness attention consciousness embedded in a space mm -hmm with an interface mechanism called a body <clears throat> that has a lot of layers within it. There's a whole lot of layers of mind. There's a whole lot of layers of material, but in any of those, like the purpose of the, of the, of the system is to intake feedback from a constraint network, mm -hmm. right? So there's a constraint network of the material world and this integrates feedback from it and builds it into a model that based on its ability to, represent in it in a represent with fidelity what is afforded to it by the constraint feedback it gives me a greater <clears throat> greater power to engage with reality as such mm. and allow something like beauty goodness and this thing we call love to flow through through the individual aspect of what it means to be a person. Right. Right. And that and that the way this goes wrong is very much like at least what I hear you saying, where you get disintegration between these layers when there's trauma, when there's um, when there's pain, when there's um, when there's lies, especially, when there's feedback that isn't properly integrated into the system. Sure. you get stuck right. at all these different layers 
well, I think we're born into that disintegration, you know, mm. um, in the sense that there is no, there's not a human being on the planet that doesn't endure trauma as a child, you know, mm -hmm. children are incre incredibly like, you seem like a good, good, good dude. I think you're going to be a good dad, but you're still going to traumatize your kid, man. Totally. <laughs> no matter totally. what, yeah. no matter what. And it, and it, because kids are so fragile, they're just so fragile. You look at them wrong for a second. If you got a real sensitive one, like my son, you know, you just give them a look because you're frustrated for a second and they just, you, know, you can see it, you know, they just, they just lost dad's love and it hurt so bad. And, and so we're born into that disintegration, but it serves, it serves the evolution of the soul. It serves our process. I think that I personally, my, in my belief system, I believe we come to this planet for a reason. I think we come to these specific experiences. I don't think I'm Seth Taylor. I think I'm a soul having an experience yeah. called Seth Taylor that we just labeled for this lifetime, you know, and, sure. and I came here for a reason and I, there's my mission what I, what I came here to do. And then there's all the experiences I get to have around that, that are kind of supplementary, you know, type of experiences. But I think that, um, that the integration of the soul and the integration of thought, like this is why all this, this is why everyone's having so much fun with language nowadays, right? Because we're integrating everything. We're integrating thought. We're integrating history. We're integrating our DNA, we're integrating our souls, we're integrating and we're, and then we're attempting to integrate our trauma. Mm. And this is, this is why there's a normalization more and more. And it's not the stigma there was a hundred years ago on the idea of doing work in our psychology and doing work in our, and this is why you're seeing even in psycho, even in psychology models there, you're seeing the integration now of things like energy work, you know, mm. with psychology, with philosophy, guys like you exist, where there's all these different things crashing in the same space. And you kind of get, you know, I can tell you get passionate about it, right? Well, yeah. it's because we're meant to, we're meant to, we are an yeah. integrating species now. And we've hit it, finally hit a level of our evolution, at least in some pockets of the world, where that integration is bringing joy, creativity, and solving real problems. And, and I, I have hope for things like climate change and I have hope for, you know, some of the places in the world where they're still living in those really, really primitive states because of guys like you because we because we're integrating this way totally. and we just gonna we're just gonna continue to do that and i just i i mean it's it is language but it's fun you know and for totally. me like you know when you said you said uh christianity and neoplatonism and i for me uh quantum physics is the language totally. that I, I supplement into it with christian ancient christian spirituality yep. with a with a more probably you could say a kind of a zen zen type of yep. perspective yep. there's certain things i'm and that's me i get to smash those together and i'm just and i'm listening to, you know i you know guys like rob bell you know where rob's a real you know rob was a mentor of mine for a while and he and he, he's just a, that's his job is language like he just it's just all fun with language and totally. peter rollins peter rollins fun with language right yeah all that kind of stuff i just absolutely love that part of being a person mm -hmm. um it but it 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 none of it means anything if we don't go into the dark with yeah. each other yeah. until you know it's I mean? made existential right yeah. until it's made real yeah so yeah. Would you mind if i ask you some things yeah yeah of course so i'm curious when it comes to you have all this language and it's obviously describing something but if it's just the ego just putting together words and it's not going to be real and eventually it'll show itself for not being real. And that's been my life. My life is have an experience, gain the language for it. And then the ego jets past jets way up with all its language. And then it has to double back on itself because it realizes it skipped all this trauma. <laughs> you know what I mean? And then I, so then I work in reverse and then it goes boom. And then it goes to another level. And then it has to work back down through all the trauma. And then it goes boom. So that's been this thing where it's like, kind of like, it feels like falling down the stairs sometimes, you know, <laughs> you know, but it's working yes. Yes. Like gradually. Yes. You know? yes. So I'm kind of curious about your story a little bit when it comes to some of the dark, some of the moving into the darkness and what that looks like, what that looked like and how that influenced your language, how the language influenced it. Do you yeah. know what I'm asking? You mean, it's okay yeah. to ask about that? Oh, no, absolutely. Yeah. Um, I mean, so the place where I ended up coming, coming to know you, even though you didn't know me, I knew you um, through your book and then through your podcast had to do with, like, I've, I've been a pretty, um, my life has been quite blessed, I would say, quite fortunate. Yeah. Now, I, I grew up without any money, but I had parents that loved me. Um, it was in a, it was a fundamentalist Christian um, place. And so there were, there's all that kind of stuff, but my parents really were doing the very best they could. They really loved us a lot and that shown through. So I was very fortunate in that way. Um, and I haven't had a ton of, you know, I've had issues that everybody has had, but I haven't had a ton of real specific, huge traumatic experiences in my life. Mm -hmm. Um, but for me, the thing that I, I finished college, I was 
you know, I was an evangelical Christian and I couldn't kick pornography. Mm. It just, you know, I was like most people, I had run across pornography when I was like 12, 13. Um, mm. And then here it up and down and it never really went away. And I was spending time in the, <clears throat> in some very well-meaning and well-attempted models to try to force it out of your life. And that wasn't working for me. And so that's when I came across um, Feels Like Redemption and my pilgrimage. And that for me, as, as you guys talk about in the books, the, the movement into questioning where is the trauma coming from that's creating the need for medication that's mm -hmm. driving me to this, what it, this form of medication. And so that involved, I started doing some of the processing exercises mm -hmm. um, and I had already been doing some meditation shortly prior to this. So the space was starting to get familiar, but so initially it looked like me going into these kind of meditative spaces, opening up to feeling my body, trying to feel where there might be trauma, where there was resistance in my body um, and seeing what came up. So initially I had some very <clears throat> profound um, and some fairly terrifying, but um, experiences in that space where I started to let go of, of things like that and process through and move through different areas of my life where I had shut myself down, or maybe as I would say now, le left part of myself behind places mm. that I had disintegrated either purposefully or not, um, and lost part of my soul, maybe something like that. Mm. So that was a very difficult and like, it, it felt like work to do it at that point. Yeah. Um, now, as I've progressed further, I very much feel what you're talking about. Like for me, it's always, I'm, I'm very cerebral. I'm always running, you know, what about this? What about that? What about this? What about that? And just piecing together, you know, I call it, I call my YouTube channel climbing on Mount Sophia, because for me, um, that's how I, I picture this whole thing we call reality is this, this mountain of wisdom, um, well, our explanation, our un our ability to understand reality, not reality itself, maybe depends mm -hmm. on which way you're talking about it. But yeah. in this, from this direction, not maybe reality itself, but the way we speak about it, that it's this, it's this living thing that I get to participate in, and I can move around within it and look at different pieces and see how they fit together, and see how there's tension between them, and I when I, when I get a little bit more I don't know, strength or ability to go into the mountain and look around at these pieces and try to resolve tension between ideas, then it's really e easy for my ego to spin up too much. And my, my sense of actually integrated being in the world in myself sure. to lag behind. Yeah. And so there's, I very much feel that movement back and forth. Back. Yeah. <laughs> um, but like you said, I mean, it's one of those things where it's a little bit like trust the process for me. Mm hmm because I'm like, well, it keeps, it keeps taking me upward. So, yeah. and, but it's always a, uh, I mean, my, my, my dream and my prayer is to be like a fully, like, like fully embedded, fully, like I'm, to have, to have God come through this body in the full real way. Right. Right. Yeah, the, the, the term I somebody told me we were talking to somebody yesterday talking about the term embodiment to be fully embodied. Yeah, because you can feel it that some part of you is not right. You, mm -hmm. know, you just go, "There's yeah, I'm not, I'm not." And 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 most of it you just feel existentially, right? You don't. It's coming from the sur underneath somewhere. It's humming under the surface in kind of an uncomfortable way. <laughs> and totally. You, yeah, you just know. And it's funny because, you know, some people go, well, it's not, you know, it's not a destination, it's a journey. And I go, yeah, but it's probably the destination, you know, it like, you know, when you're on a pilgrimage, like you, you reach spots and you go, I think I'm going to stay here for a while because it's so lovely, you know? Yeah. And so, yeah. you know, that, you know, and so I think it's okay to let yourself go. Yeah, no, there's a spot that I'm going to get to. And the, the key is when I get there, I'm going to have to reorient myself to my ego yeah. some more. And then, cause it's going to go, let's just stay here. And you go, no. We could rest for a little while though, kind of thing, yeah. you know, <laughs> and, then, yeah. and then we're going to keep going. So I, I totally understand that. I, I've dealt with some, I mean, even just this year, I probably dealt with some of the deepest stuff I've ever, I've ever come across within me that I was working unconsciously underneath me all the time and everyone else could see it, but I never could, you know, and the key is that you have enough courage to just take that one more step, you know, 
And, yeah. you know, but sometimes suffering has to be the catalyst for that. Unfortunately, you know, I mean, when you have kids, it's interesting. Cause it's like, it's, you're both introducing yourself to your greatest love and your greatest suffering at the same time, you know, <laughs> and, and it's, and it's, it's a really, really powerful catalyst. And so, mm. you know, and, and you can just trust that your spirit is, I always tell clients, the spirit's like a multidimensional Rubik's cube. Mm your spirit is the second you set your intention, the spirit just starts going, taking turns and, and how much suffering de depends on how much resistance you have to every turn the Rubik's of the Rubik's cube. But remembering that you're the one actually turning it, you know? Yeah. And, and so you're, you know, you're absolutely right. It's a, it is, it sequences the process. And if you can, and faith is the process of learning to trust that, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know, and that's what Jesus was constantly talking about going, everything's okay. Just trust. And mm -hmm. everybody's like, how do we trust? Yeah. One step at a time. <laughs> like, yeah. 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 I mean, and that's, that's always the hard thing is, is that, and I've noticed that this is where it, the way in which my ego always speeds up is my, my attempt to fix things. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's like, I'll, I'll move into this space and, and at different points, I've been able to existentialize it for longer periods of time than others mm -hmm. where, where I'm not, trying to do anything that's not there yeah right where i actually am in the now where i'm not when things come i address them when i when when i go into the patient room to talk to the patient i don't have anything to say right but everything needs to be said is said because there's no me saying it. sure and but then there's other times where you know i've i've it always starts with a judgment right it always starts mm -hmm. with a this is this shouldn't be this way right and it can be anything from you know some political thing to you know just i feel like i looked wrong at somebody and i feel bad about that and i start mm -hmm. judging myself and then it creates this whole like external layer of reality that's not real right. that i'm projecting on in this side sideline process in my right. brain and it just saps all my energy yeah and yeah. the more the more i go into that space the more I'm moving over there and I'm running this side thing, right. I can build out a whole reality there. And I think this is a lot of the ways that that kind of disintegration really happens for us. Because the reason you wake up in the morning and you feel like crap every morning mm -hmm. is because, well, one, all your energy is gone because you're projecting everything. But two, because you're really trying to make a world real that's not real. Mm -hmm. And you can't do that. Right. Well, you can, you just have to <laughs> shut off certain parts of yourself in order to allow it's like pornography, right? Yeah. You allowed pornography. Pornography was very real until it wasn't. Yeah. You know what I mean? And you feel it existentially at first. And, and even the belief systems, the guilt and stuff like that kind of works on you when you have a belief system that says you're not supposed to be that way. So you have all these various things in uh, held in a dissonance, you know? Yeah. But it, but it works for a lot of people. It's like, uh, I was working with this lady. She was an alcoholic and addicted to cocaine. And it was really interesting because she was like, uh, I love cocaine. I love it. And she was completely inside of a space where the the illusion that it was actually awesome because you feel so good. Mm -hmm. She was locked inside that illusion. It was really fascinating. There wasn't even a part of her going, cocaine is bad. She was like, alcohol is bad because she'd done so many horrible things when she was drunk that she was like, alcohol is bad. But but she's like, but when I'm on coke, I'm, I'm, the, I'm my best self. Mm -hmm. And it's really interesting. You're like, oh, wow. So you have to work from within the illusion first. Yeah, yeah. And it's like, and it's like anything else. It's real until it's not real. Yeah. And that's the funny thing about human beings, right? And and you know, it's very, it's a, it's a cliche when you say, well, we're spiritual people having a human experience. Well, that's actually true. I mean, you can pretty yeah. much trace every human existence from being the fact that we're third dimensional and fifth dimensional at the same time. Yeah. You know, and yeah. those two things are going. And it's and you can just sense it underneath it all. You know, you sense that. You know, and it's those of us that can wake up to that sense without doing too much damage and we're the lucky ones but there's a lot of people that never will yeah yeah you know i watch my parents like my stepdad and my mom i don't think either one of them's ever going to wake up yeah most of the baby boomer generation they're just going to go to their grave like that in that illusion and that's okay yeah but they can't even look back and see how much damage there's just bodies everywhere and they don't even see it you know yeah 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 exactly yeah you so you really can like you move into these disintegrated spaces and and the the perceptual landscape can can really be manipulated yeah like and, and this is and this so i want to move towards the psychedelics conversation because i very much want to talk to you about that but one, you, know, you said you said ram das so i figured we were heading there so. <laughs> yeah. 
I know, just you know, just you know, in context, last just three days ago, I I did an eight hour deep dive of suicide. So okay, so let's talk about that. Let's I'll okay. leave what I was going to say before. So okay. just as as context, I'm yeah. I'm in a space where I'm planning, intending to move into uh, psilocybin treatments here in Oregon, and actually wow. becoming a facilitator for that. Wow, where in Oregon are you? Uh, Salem. Okay, so I got a buddy that does it does it for a living down in Bend. Oh, okay, perfect. Yeah. yeah. So now you know it's this is a pretty recent thing that's come on my, onto my horizon. Mm -hmm. um, I my first mushroom journey was about a year ago, okay. um, and it was not a, it, I didn't just kind of engage in it for fun. I had read a lot of the research um, from a from a clinical point of view because I do medicine, so that's my yeah. where a lot of my temporal existence happens um and so i'd read a lot of the research i'd watched uh, some of these different documentaries and things um which shifted my whole viewpoint from the oh you know these are drugs just that that starting point is such so much of a block for people right and then it had moved me around to realizing that okay no matter what they are in any other frame from a clinical frame they're most at least as far as we can tell now by far the most attract uh most effective and meaningful mental health medicine that we've ever come up with ever for sure yeah. and so just from that perspective i was like okay well i want to i'm i'm gonna move into this so I, that was my approach to it and now i'm coming obviously i have all this other stuff now that i didn't have at different points in my life and i'm trying to blend it all together I'm trying to provide some kind of a nexus point for these things to bridge together Mm -hmm. Clinic, clinical medicine, spirituality, philosophy, and this kind of movement towards processing the disintegrations and traumas that people have to allow them space to become real. Yeah. Um, so, so that's the background that I that I'm coming at this from. Yeah. And um, but I would love to hear your your perspective on psychedelics, how they fit in this process, what it's meant for you, maybe, um, yeah. and whatever you you're willing to share about your recent exploration i'm all ears <laughs> well I, how many how many dives have you done i think five you've done five so i've done eight okay and so and so you know you know in a conversation assuming there's people listening to us right now it's if they haven't done it it's a difficult thing to describe but but the easy the easiest way to understand it is that all of human struggle is a garbage can with a lid on it and we spend all this energy in time and and we're trying to empty the garbage and we're using psychology and education and money and philosophy and all these kind of things to try to get the lid off so we can empty the garbage and some of it works but it works very slowly and gradually by hacking it to pieces or whatever psychedelics simply remove the lid and so you get oh hey you get a five hour t time span where the lid's gone what are you going to do and and that's that's the best way i can understand it and describe it and, and, and it's like, okay, you got five hours, go ahead and do it. And if you have people, it's not an easy place to, to navigate. So if you have people that know what they're doing, like you're, you know, you're going to move towards helping people with it. If you have people that know what they're doing, some come at it from like my buddy probably comes at it from a more philosophical philosopher, psychologist kind of perspectives and where the lady I just dealt with comes at it very much from a shamanic um, mm -hmm. standpoint. She actually takes the medicine with you journeys into it with you is the most masterful thing I've ever witnessed in my life. And blown away by it but but it's simply that's how it is now the thing about it is the levels of depth within us the levels of complexity within us and how we have the capacity to bury things so deeply that not even the medicine can touch it is a really important part of it so if you think of it like a big toothpaste tube the work we do in our lives of of self-reflection meditation therapy psychology contemplation all this kind of work, even conversations like this, have a capacity to squeeze that tube from the bottom. And if I'm squeezing from the bottom and I've got stuff down here, let's say ancestral trauma, okay, I'm half Celt, half Viking, and I've always enjoyed dancing around on my Celtic side. You know, and recently the Viking side has emerged, and how much collective trauma there is in my in my lineage and in my DNA, 
and it's been humming under the surface for a long time. And then people have been trying to point it out to me and I've been experiencing it and not knowing what it is, but it felt mm. like terror and rage and anger. And it's been coming up. It's been squeezing up. Now I've done a bunch of dives before and there's been a couple where I'm passing through some sort of space and I'm looking down and I can see this super evil, dark thing down there. And I'm like, yeah, we'll deal with that later. Yeah. Well, that, well, that's because even the medicine was like, yeah, we're not ready for that yet. Mm -hmm. You know, because there is a type of consciousness in it, right? That's the most unique part of it is that we're dealing with a, a form of consciousness that lives in plants, you know, mm -hmm. and lives in collectives. You know, they, I call it studies. They see about forests, how forests have a consciousness and they communicate, they communicate in their own way. We're, we're just basically saying, hey, you know, we're looking at that, those, those types of consciousness and saying, can you help us with this? And they're like, yeah, that's why we're put on this planet. Yeah. Right. And so now, yeah, it's, that's super. We're all part of the same thing here. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that's a super metaphysical, mystical way of looking at it. But yeah. once you do it, you you actually understand, right? At some level, you you come out of it with all the understanding and no understanding at the same time, right? Yeah, yeah. like going, holy crap, and I have questions. I guess know every, I know everything, believe nothing. Yes, that's a good way. Oh, great way to put it. I mean, I'm gonna hijack that for me, okay? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> so, yeah. But uh, but that's the idea is that you're just pulling the lid off and it, and whatever is whatever is closest to the surface when that lid comes off is the thing that, that the plants are going to help you with first. And and I've done 13 years of profound, deep therapeutic work within myself. I've done eight so psilocybin journeys and I've come to this place where I finally was able to, this journey on Wednesday was a completion of mm -hmm. dealing with about 2000 years of uh, the most well-defended ancestral trauma you've ever seen in your life and it was anchored in me in some very unique ways um mm -hmm. especially because of some of the unique forms of trauma when my father died when i was 12 mm -hmm. had it anchored in and if i got into the physics of it it would just, you'd be like wait a minute what like it, it was and sure. it, you know i was shown all those things but i've emptied it but it, you, with entanglement and stuff is kind of would be what you'd be referring to there yeah, the type of entanglement, what anchors trauma within us is is basically like, why is this person struggle, but this person doesn't? Me and my yeah. brother are twins, right? We've had virtually, our childhood was virtually the same, but we dealt with things in our adult life very, very differently. And the question is why? And, and a lot of it is because the ways the trauma was anchored in me versus the ways the trauma was anchored in him. And it could be certain incidents. I had certain experiences in my father's death that he didn't have. Mm -hmm. We both have the same ancestry. Mm -hmm. But that trauma of our ancestors anchors into it anchored into our human lives through the sure. trauma we endured in this life. It had it creates connection points. Yeah, and yeah. again, we're talking butterfly effect here, right? We're doing this yeah. web totally. of, of of complexity when we come to the physics the physics of it. And yeah. you can see the physics. This is one of the reasons why a physicist does a lot of drawing because there's a lot of things you can draw but you can't describe. Yeah, you know what I mean, or, or yeah. you uh, like putting the numbers up won't make any sense. Putting the yeah. formula, but I could draw a shape, you know, yeah. and that would make more sense. And so. Totally. You know, so if I if I had a big whiteboard behind me instead of this awesome painting, I could I could draw for you. Here's what just happened, um, and you'd go, oh. But the the this is why I love I, God. I just one of my favorite passages in the Bible was when when Jesus heals this blind guy, which was physics. Okay, we're dealing with quantum physics. He was a master of operating yeah. on a subatomic. Like if, if you really, if you like, one of this was one of the big things. As a quick side note, this is one of the big things for me coming out of Christianity. Or yeah. the version of Christianity that was before, I don't know. I mean, anyway, yeah. it's like, okay, we all say we believe these miracles, but then we treat it as if, you know, we have this story over here and then the real world over here. Yeah. It's like, no, man, if you actually believe this, yeah. if you actually believe this, then you're you're believing that there was a, a, a movement of energy. And even the way Jesus re refers to his miracles, he refers to them with things of talking about energy. Yeah. And there's a movement of energy such that the atoms, like the molecules and the atoms that are existing in this person's body moved right. around yeah, to the, to their proper position, just like that. Yeah. That's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. Essentially you say you refer to it as energy because you're, refer you're referring to when the woman grabbed his robe and she was healed. Right. And he says some power, I felt power go out from me. Yeah. And then that's the problem is that the English translation word power is problematic. <laughs> you know <what> I mean, <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's yeah power as opposed to if you'd said i felt energy leave my body yeah. everybody would think it very see it very differently right and it's just a translation one word and they go yeah. power oh therefore he's a wizard he's like thor or something like that yeah, you know yeah. and of course we have not. a hard time with the word power we do we do we struggle with that right but he's you know he he was he heals this guy this blind guy he goes and gets looked at by the priest the priests are like he heals by the power of beelzebub mm -hmm. right because they're they're living in this super this kind of you know just superstitious space and and he and he says the guy's like whatever 
because <laughs> he just goes, yeah. all I know is once I was blind, now I see. And in the end, it comes down to something that simple. That's why I said at the beginning, like people just want to wake up and feel great. Yeah. And you can go, oh, let me show you these 12 books about quantum physics and Zen life and, and, and language and history and theology. And then they'll go, no, I'm good. I'm just going to play with my kids. I just feel great right now. You know what I mean? They don't really, I have people all the time. They're super brilliant in whatever capacity they do. And they just want to wake up tomorrow and feel good. I, this guy owns six businesses and he, and he has all this stuff and he's a master of his universe, but he just wants to wake up tomorrow and feel good. Yeah. And that's, and that ultimately is what we're talking about. And psychedelics just have a capacity to get to those sources quicker. Yeah. Now, psychedelics also, also have a capacity if, if not respected properly, and not navigated well, they have the capacity for the ego simply to hijack and create a massive attachment to it, a compulsive attachment to it. I know friends that have gone into it for healing and they just end up being addicts. Mm. And it's not because I'm thinking of one person specifically. It's not because it wasn't those weren't real experiences, but when he came out of them because he had no he had no capacity for proper understanding of his ego. And he had he had a he had this relationship with his ego where it's like my ego is my friend, my ego is my buddy, my ego is my leader. And his ego is like, dude, you just experienced the ultimate truth, which you do. Okay. Right. And psychedelics like, show you the, the truth. Right. Yeah. And then you come out and your his ego created an attachment to that truth while in a sober state. And so he became massive conspiracy theorist. He just starts mm -hmm. ranting all the time about this is the truth of everything. And if everybody could just understand it. And then of course he just becomes someone who has to, has to smoke weed every day. And he has to do this kind of stuff because the ego is like, we have to maintain that truth now, but he can't integrate it into a sober state, which is one of the reasons why I don't play with mushrooms. I don't, I'm, you know, everybody's like, we microdose. I don't microdose. I don't, I don't do it for kicks and giggles. I just, yeah. it, for me, it's a teacher and then I have to integrate. And this experience I had on Wednesday, I'll probably be integrating for the next two years. Okay. So this is, so this leads me to one of the questions that I actually wrote down is how should we, how should we relate to these medicines yeah. in a way that embeds them in some kind of wisdom tradition that, uh, that creates space for integration? Because yeah. like, I very much agree with you. Like there's this, there's this significant danger and this is true of anything that is, that is imaginal, right? Yeah. Even just the ability to sit there and have imagination right? and dream about something, daydream about something. It can be deeply, deeply valuable if you're doing it from the space of attempting to integrate issues in your real world, yeah. attempting to pull things apart so that they can actually come together again but it's not helpful if you're just trying to escape from your reality. And so this, this posture of what's, what's my purpose? Am I trying to escape? Am I trying to just like have a good time because this sucks? Yeah. Then you, then you end up in some kind of Gnostic nightmare. Yeah. Um. So how do we, how do we work with this need for integration around these, especially well, as they're becoming more mainstream? Yeah. Yeah. I, I would say that, um, the the key to it and actually i was talking to the lady that i was working with the other day about this and because she gave she does she's amazing she does body work massage to help it integrate into the actual physical body when you're done but i was asking her about that exact same thing i, I didn't say it as articulately as you do but she she said uh she was talking about you know i said how do you i said imagine a lot of people come to you for this she goes yeah i go how do you i imagine you don't work with everybody that comes to you she goes no i don't i go well how do you know who to work with she goes well Part of it's just letting spirit kind of guide me, but she goes, but the biggest thing is people have, people have to come to a certain level of, of introspection. Like she was just basically referring to therapies needed before you begin to approach things at this level. And it's like, cause if you don't even know the garbage can exists mm -hmm. and I just th bring you over here and pop the lid open, mm -hmm. you can be one, you can have a psychotic break. And two, like your ego is going to just hijack everything you experience in order to create that system of control and you just become someone who's a compulsive you know you're one of those guys who's addicted to marijuana but just talks about how it makes you enlightened and you're just an enlightened guy because of it and and so the you know the integration of it, i think requires one we have to legalize these things mm -hmm. you know and and as opposed to let the medical model hijack the process which unfortunately which you know fortunately they can't really because once the mushrooms are in you they didn't give a shit about the you know the, about the, the medical model right yeah yeah but, yeah it defeats it defeats that once we lose our fear of these things, then there's a system that's going to come in and go, okay, now we have to ha know how to use them properly. And you're going to see a massive, massive expansion of that. But you're also going to see the shadow is going to be there. Yeah. There's no question. The shadow is going to be there. You're going to have those people that just go off and in, in, into that escapism because some people simply don't want it. But if somebody's, I've had a lot of people, a lot of my clients say, hey, what do you think I should do this? I'd say, yeah, when you're ready. 
Yeah. What makes me ready? There's a certain th- place we come to therapeutically where you're ready, you know? And, and that's the thing that I would never recommend somebody take mushrooms for, for a therapeutic journey if they haven't even done therapy. And I had right. a buddy who did that and, and he went ayahuasca, he went uh, psilocybin, he went MDMA, he went all these different things and, and it, and it totally screwed him up. I mean, it, right. he went to a really bad place for a long, long time. I mean, after his second ayahuasca journey, he tried to commit suicide. Mm. Because he was literally, I call it pulling at the tiger's tail. He's reaching down and he'd never even done therapy. And he's reaching down into the deep subconscious of hit, not only his trauma from his life, but his ancestors and all that stuff. This guy had been in 21 foster homes when he was a kid. Wow. And oh, he's gosh. pulling wow. on that in these temporary ways. And he's, he popped the lid off and reached as deep as he could into the garbage can, yanked on the thing. And then when the lid came back on, it's now it's on the surface, torturing him from the subconscious. And he has no capacity or paradigm to be able to work on that. Yeah. Yeah. So his ego, his ego takes over and just goes, we can't live with this and yeah. picks up a gun. You know what yeah. I mean? And, and that's yeah. the thing is it's, that's, that's why, man, we are, that's why the, the plants have waited as long as they had to show themselves. If that makes sure. any sense. Sure. Now, sure. now when you said how, how do, what, what traditions exist to help us framework this? Well, they've been there all along. It's the indigenous sure. traditions, right? The indigenous traditions have been there for thousands of years waiting for their time to be noticed and there's a reason that we didn't wipe them out we wiped out their culture but they those those truths still exist those things still exist you know the the, the native american understanding of what these things are that i mean you see other people going to peru right everybody yeah. heading down to south america they've been doing this for thousands of years so they do exist and they've been sitting there waiting for us and i really think that they've been that the plants and the traditions have been waiting for human evolution to come to a place where it's it's time to integrate these things and i think that it, i think that 500 years from now the that this moment will be seen as a critical kind of crux in the entire process of human evolution yeah oh absolutely because the, the integration once again you're going to see us back integrated with the earth integrated with the plants integrated you, you see how the natives in a lot of the native traditions not all of them but a lot of them walk so we walk so softly on the planet because they were in relationship with that consciousness yeah. Yeah. and this is now the western world starting to come back into that relationship yeah Does that makes sense absolutely i mean one of the models that i'll often use is uh, the model of the evolution of ideas over time because mm. you have evolution that happens at say the material stage and we, we've come i mean thank god we've come to understand that reasonably well because i think everything kind of happens this way that i ideas run on the human consciousness mm-hmm. and and we we all exist as nodes um nodes of attention and it's it's attention that that fuels these ideas yeah so yeah and and the unique thing about human agency is that we can choose by by means of employing our attention in particularly um, wise in a particularly wise manner we can see where an idea is going to go and thus we can choose which idea to pay attention to so we have the ability to abstract evol- the evolutionary process because basic material evolution you know a, a process in any particular path that is chosen by an organism it runs out that path until it dies right it will it'll once it's on that path path it's on that path and if it's the wrong path it has to just die because the one that took the right path is the one that's going to keep going yeah but what we can do with i with ideas is we can actually notice hey no no this one's going down a path that that's that's not going to end well so i can actually choose to pay my attention to a different idea so we mm-hmm. can like hyper jump evolution not just temporally but in terms of its accuracy because we can we cannot just die because we believed in a bad idea we yeah. can actually shift which idea we want to pay attention to and somehow <clears throat> in this frame of human evolution we're we're serving the purpose of creating higher and higher levels from which we can like the universe can see itself yeah in the way that you you mentioned earlier so like to do that, we needed technology. Right? Right. We needed we needed to build machines. We needed to learn how to measure things really well. We needed to, you know, develop computers so that we could interface really, really intricately from vast di- distances that we can time and space travel. Essentially, yeah. we we yeah. time and space travel all the time. It's just yeah. that's what this is conversation is right now. Right. Um, right. And and so we needed to develop those things, but yeah. there were enough 
jump off points along the way that people took that have manifested as really, really negative trauma in the world. You know, things yeah. like, um, like there's been so much pain and now, you know, in the sense, a lot of us were, were at this really critical point because one of the major things that a lot of people, especially in kind of mainstream culture accepted as as part of the jump to development of technology was that that, that the material world was primary. Mm -hmm. material was primary that all that mattered was to have this technology and that technology would solve any problem yeah you know those that kind of set of basic assumptions and the one that is that reality is basically computational and mm -hmm. rationality and reason is basically computational like those yeah. ideas just man they they take us down to a dead end but there's a lot of us that are running that dead end down pretty hard right now yeah 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 it's interesting when you're talking about technology because that's a really interesting thing being, a, I mean, I'm essentially, I'm a therapist, I'm a life coach, but it's a really interesting thing to watch how therapy still is a thing that eventually everyone goes, all things have failed. I have to do the most human thing. Does that make sense? <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? Like, despite everything that exists, you know, I got a buddy who works for a VR company and he's trying to develop modalities for therapy within VR. And I, and, and it's, and it's awesome. And it's really, really cool. But I'm kind of like, Ultimately, it's just people, man. Like, like I get it. Like, you, it, all the technology is cool, and we can keep trying to do this. But ultimately, when, it, when every human being, and I think it'll be this a thousand years from now, people will eventually go. I think I have to do the most human thing, and and technology can't help me with this anymore. Yeah. But yeah. technology had to come to the point where it showed me that it can't help me with yeah. this. Does that yeah. make sense? Totally. Like, yes. No amount of medicine. No. I, I help people get off meds a lot. People come to me and they're like, "I'm on meds and I want to get off it." And, and so we're like, "All right, we do this process of working into that." And it's interesting to watch them. They go, "That's failed. That's failed. That's failed. This technology failed. This thing failed. This model failed. Everything failed. Now I'm just going to do the human thing. And there's yeah. no other route here, you know. Yeah. I, and I think that that'll be like that a thousand years from now. I th I see the world. I love I love some of the science fiction stuff. I love um, one of the things I love is a. Uh, um, like I love Marvel movies, okay? Because Marvel movies take all this, these philosophies and theologies and all these uh, the, and quantum physics and it plays with the theories and turns it into just super fun movies. Mm -hmm. Black Panther, I love Black Panther. And one of the things I loved most about it, there's all these things to love about it. One of the things I love the most about it is that it showed what does retaining an indigenous tradition look like when you're at the height of human technology? Mm -hmm. uh, you know what I mean? Like it just says, well, this vibranium gave us the ability to develop the most advanced technologies that could possibly exist on the earth. But you still see this retention of profound levels of indigenous understanding, indigenous tradition and plant medicine, right? <laughs> like you yeah. see all of this working in this perfectly integrated space. They literally with that movie and those comic books, they created a perfectly integrated space, except mm -hmm. for, of course, and this is what Marvel movies just can't get it is that because nobody would watch the movies except for of course the existence of violence right? Of yep. right yeah that's the one thing that simply goes you know when they when the king has to fight to the death to retain himself as a king you go that's the most primitive thing that you could possibly imagine right it does it, <laughs> and it makes the and it makes the movie silly like for yeah. me that the whole thing bends on this crux go that is just simply idiotic how yeah. could a place be this advanced this evolved in every aspect except for we still have to fight to the death to be the king <laughs> that doesn't make any sense well you it's know. like I, and I mean, I think this brings up a really profound point for me is yeah. I spend the most of my time working in and around the space of death. And, and I mean, that's, that's on purpose. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I talk to people, I mean, at work, I talk to people every day about their death every day, mm -hmm. because, you know, there's this issue that we have where any, any conceptual framework of how reality starts has to start with the place of being an individual person yeah and just being in this space yeah. and the, the fundamental constraints of that space are you don't choose where you where you start and you don't choose where you end and you don't really get to control what happens in between you can yeah. just influence it a little bit yeah and that you know our entire like we almost it's really difficult for us to drop the narrative framework because a narrative necessarily has a beginning and an end. Yeah. We really can't conceptualize a, a, a an, an infinite time frame. We can't conceptualize 
an infinite space. We talk about it, but like there's very few people that are really able to existentially get what that means. Yeah. And so, so when we, when we deal with, and, and I think this is, I mean, I spend a lot of time trying to pull at the, at the threads of the tensions of the Christian story. Mm-hmm. And, you know, for me, one of the central tensions of the Christian story that makes it a Gnostic mythos for most people is this conceptualization of the end of time and heaven and hell and this you know we it's it's there for some reason but because everyone has to make it materially real because of this necessary like oh everything has an end because i have an end and so because of that we can't get out of this space of the need for conflict we can't get out of the space of this need for okay there's something that has to happen between the beginning and the end it can't all just be you know it can't possibly be one whole thing that actually is operating in harmony right because we don't understand our sense of being finite within a whole right yeah so that's that's the thing for those movies with me is like they always like they they reach at these things but then in order to tell a story that people will watch they have to just like throw that ego thing in there yeah, you have to. Yeah, because nobody will watch the story of enlightenment. You know, we will. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, yeah. so, you know, it's just boring. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. that's the thing, you know, and it doesn't, <laughs> you have to appeal to the ego. Nobody's going to watch it because if it's enlightenment, everybody would just go. I love, I just watched the other day, uh, Love and Thunder, Thor Love and Thunder, okay. and how he's in this peace and this enlightenment, but then he fights wars and then, and it's just laughable because, like, that's not a thing, you know, <laughs> yeah. but and, it, and it's fascinating. You know, one of my journeys, actually, one of my, my psilocybin journeys, it was, I, I was really pay, really asking a question. I actually took nine grams. Okay. And, and, and I, cause I was like, I, I tended to get stuck in some of the soul narrative stuff. And I just was like, sure. I'm going to blow off every barrier here. And, and yeah. it's probably not, probably not wise. Cause I did it unguided too. Sure, but I, sure. I, I went and, and I was given this teaching I was given this teaching because I was asking this question. I was always asking this question. Well, why do we do this? Because we just come here and then we suffer and we die. Like, why? Yeah. What's yeah. the point? It's always, what's the point? What's the point? What's the point? Why do we keep doing this? And the universe, God, whatever was teaching me, I don't think it was the plants. I think I, I went past, I, I think the plant consciousness was like, well, we'll see you later. We'll be here when you get back. But I, yeah. it was this teaching. I was shown plants, you know? You average like plant or something like that. If you trace it down to the roots, it's really vibrant and green. But if you get the closer you get out to the edge, it starts to wither, right? And then a lot of times the tips are brown or whatever, and they're dying. And it was like, yeah, it's like that. I'm like, what do you mean? So I was shown the Big Bang. Okay, it started here and it blew out. And you guys are out at the edge. And that's why it's dying. And then I was shown a candle. And like, if you put your hand way above a candle, you won't feel the heat. But the closer you get down, you start to feel its energy. But the energy is dying and dissipating. And the farther away from the source you go. And it was just like, yeah, you're you're out at the edge of the the thing. And I'm like, yeah, "Yeah, but why? It's like, well, there was an explosion. And I said, yeah, but why? Explosion. And there was no real purpose. It was just like, there was an explosion. And you guys are on the edge where the, you're out on the edge where the energy is withering. Yeah, but you're evolving, and, and and the process of evolution is coming closer and closer to that center. Yeah, you know that's one one of the reasons. It's interesting in the Christian tradition, there's all this talk about eternal life, right? Eternal life, eternal life. There, there are parts of us already that are closer to that center, but here in the third dimension, here on the linear timeline, we're out on the edge. Our fifth dimensional selves are closer to the source. Our seventh dimensional selves are closer to the source. Our twelfth dimensional self is the source. Mm-hmm. We are just, but we, but most of us are functioning on the third dimension and identify with it. Yeah. Right? And if we can actually, that's, that's what spiritual life is. Spiritual life is trying to come to the point where we can get to that part of us that's closer to the source. And, yeah. and that's the ones that, I mean, I have this friend of mine, he was just sending me a Marco Polo. He's in his seventies and he's got cancer and he's mm-hmm. facing his death. And he just, he literally was just like, I, I've never seen anything like it. He's just sitting there embracing it, just going, mm-hmm. so it's just a part of life. Mm-hmm. And it's just, and if I embrace it, the release of my fear of it is giving me such profound experiences and such profound joy. And all he's doing is letting that he's letting go of the third dimension more. Yeah. And he's just popping him down. He's getting down there. He's on a daily basis. He's sitting in that like seventh dimension, just at one with the universe, just going mm-hmm. totally worth it. The body can let the body go. That's what Jesus yeah. did. Yep. That was Jesus's entire journey. Yep. He was just going, that's the ultimate thing. And I'm going to do that. And I'm going to anchor this vibration on this planet to help it evolve. 
Yeah. And it's one of those, I mean, I'm just absolutely fascinated by the physics of it. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? But at the same time, like the brain keeps searching for the purpose because it's so afraid of letting go of that third dimension. It's so afraid. There's so much fear. And, yeah. you know, that's the thing. Like, I haven't let go of that fear yet. You know, yeah. I will. Hopefully I will someday when I'm in his position, you know, but uh, I don't know, man, it is. it really is a, I think psychedelics have an incredible amount of of things to teach the human race at this point and grateful for guys like Ram Dass and, the, and, and what they did on the planet and how will be able yeah, to right. bring that. It's so fascinating to watch the resurrection of his teachings. Yeah. He's been teaching for 70 years, but just the hippies were listening to, no, not 70 years for since the seventies. Yeah. It, the hippies listened to him back then. Right. But now all guys like you and me are just going, Whoa. And they're just finding this resurrection of this truth and in integrating it in whole new ways. And, and my yeah. kids' generations, like your son, your son or your daughter's generation, they're coming in to start something brand new. Yeah. And it's our job to open the door for them by dealing with our shit. Yeah. Yeah. You know I mean? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. I want to, I want to go over one final thing. You've mentioned the um, ancestral trauma before. Yeah. Now I've read the book. Um, it was recommended to me by your brother. So I assume you probably have as well. Uh, the journey of souls. Correct. Yeah. And um, I'm, I'm, I, I don't, personally i don't believe in any specific model of the afterlife or between lives or anything like that but i see all of the models and i'm perfectly happy to play with any of them sure um so i'm really curious when you're when you're talking about ancestral trauma can you talk about that a little bit talk about what it means and maybe a little bit of how how in the model you see it how does it transfer sure. in, in a real way between uh, generations yeah, 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 it's a good question. Ancestral trauma is something I avoided for a long time um, because it's where the most pain is, and it's what inc- anchors the, the 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 heaviest density of trauma on the planet. I I, I was quite happy to play in past lives. You know, I've done a lot of past life healing, and it was interesting and it was painful, but it was fascinating, and, and I was happy to deal with my shit in this life to the point that I could see it. Mm-hmm. But ancestral trauma is where. Um, you know, you see families that are codependent, you know, and you see them connected into, you know, the, the woman's like this, her mom is like that, her grandmother's like that. And, you know, everybody's like this. That's where you're seeing, you know, in the, in the remember in the scriptures, you know, the sins of the fathers are passed down to the third and the fourth generation. Yep. You're seeing there's actual energetic, there's actual energetic cords that connect us back to our ancestors. And we carry them in very unique ways. We carry it in our DNA and we carry it in psychological patterns and we carry it in, a, there is a physics to it that anchors us into those spaces. And what it does is you have to think of it as magnetic fields, right? So the earth has a lot of magnetic fields around it. The universe ultimately is made of waves of infinite potential collected into magnetic fields. That's literally what the core of the universe, what the whole thing's made of. Those fields are strengthened by every particle that is a part of it. And, and they form their own, where you and I have an individual ego, they form their own collective ego. Mm. And that ego, I it think it's like a galaxy, Right, galaxies are held mm-hmm. held together by a gravitational force, right? And the more stars that are in the galaxy, the stronger the field is. Sure. So, thinking the best way to think about ancestral trauma is every child that's born becomes another star to strengthen mm-hmm. that. Field. Does mm-hmm. that make sense? Mm-hmm. And the collective ego is concerned with only one thing: strengthening the field. Mm-hmm. Right. Now, those fields are built through. They're they're built in the they're built with physics it's actually energy that's building the field but then like all things like you're made of energy but then you take on form bodies and then you take on psychological forms and structures so what you see when you see codependency or you see narcissism that was mine okay huge levels of narcissism in my in my family like we're all connected to it but i was much deeper in it than most of my siblings because of some of the forms of trauma in my body in this life sure That, that ancestral trauma reinforces itself and reinforces it and then takes on takes on form takes on bodies yeah. takes on psychological patterns takes on traditions takes on uh you know what you could call you know like you see it in families it's all about family it's all about family I'm like well that's really toxic though yeah, yeah, but, it's, <laughs> yeah. but it's family you know what i mean yeah, yeah, and that's yeah, why yeah. people hate going back for the holidays but we still do it because yeah. no matter how toxic it is we're going we're going to do it go do it that's the there's this thing that's field that just strengthens and strengthens and strengthens ancestral trauma is when we're finally ready to remove our, it's not that we're removing trauma from us. We're removing ourselves from trauma mm. and we are connected into it. So you could say it's both at the same time, yeah. but for some of us, for me, it went really, it started with a DNA test. 
And then, oh, I'm half Celt, I'm half Viking. Wow, you know, and I'm I, that's the story of the Hebrides Islands, you know, and all these raids. But I was more than willing to look at my Celtic side and, and identify with the victimization and the and the, and the trauma and the beatdown and the and the beauty of the Celtic side and all that. Yeah. But for years, I just ignored the Viking side. I'd pretend it didn't even exist. I'd watch those shows, and I was subconsciously blocking myself from it. But you know, it was hard for it's hard for your kids to not experience that because it, yeah. it comes through it comes through in the patterns in my pan my in my family there's a huge pattern of narcissism mm. and i was unwilling to see it you know sure, sure. until it sure, sure. until the suffering is great enough once sure. you see it in your family and you're and you're on the verge of really losing your family if you don't deal with your shit that's that's enough suffering to drive most people to do what they got to do and then it became simply where okay now i have to trust that my spirit's going to guide me into what this is and it started showing me that viking component and like the dna thing and then it's just you know, cause I do my therapy. Right. And I work into it and I work into it. And then you start going, where is this coming from? And what is this? Yeah. And you can feel it in your body. I'd feel angry. Even if it wasn't displaying the anger, I'd feel it all the time. Mm -hmm. And of course it was always coming out in subtle ways. You know, your kids start tiptoeing around you and that kind of stuff. And your, your wife's just going, man, I can't, I don't know how much more I can take this. And you're just dealing with it. That's how my, my, my process has been over the years. I'm helping people all the time and wondering, why don't I feel happier? Why don't I feel more compassion? Why don't I, I don't know. Cause because it's always underneath, always humming and humming and humming. And a couple of years ago is when it first really started coming to the surface mm -hmm. in a psilocybin journey. Um, mm -hmm. It actually emerged from its deep, deep, deep unconscious into a, a, a subconscious place mm -hmm. that was closer to the surface is the best way to understand it. Sure. And then, um, and then this last journey, this I did just a few days ago was about finally ending that. And I did, mm -hmm. and it was mm -hmm. a, it was, it was what you would call the hero's journey you know, to yeah. use the archetype language. Um, you know, I, I was in it and it was sheer terror. It was five hours of, of complete and total, utter, utter terror. Mm. Um, you know, my family has been trying to show me this for a long time. My siblings have been trying to show me this for a long time. They're connected into it too, but just not as deep as me. You know, sure. they they have the same patterns, but they've been trying to explain it to me and show me, but I've been unable to see it. Sure. But it was the medicine and this lady, this beautiful soul just took me where I had to go. And it was the scariest mm. thing is easily the scariest thing I've ever even conceived of in my mind. And it was the most yeah, well-defended yeah. trauma you've ever seen in your entire life. And there were some very unique forms of trauma in me that I, I discovered and was able to heal that were anchoring it. And I was able to go into that and dissipate all that energy and end it. But a good mm. way to understand is bloodlines. Mm. I ended the bloodline. Mm. So now my family gets to be a new bloodline, which mm. if you think about it on a physics level, contributes to the type of vibrational shift on the planet that evol helps evolve the planet. And I actually think a lot of people... Lots of people are coming, a lot of souls are coming into bodies on this planet for that purpose of ending mm -hmm. the bloodlines, because that's what anchors the trauma on our planet deepest. Yeah, It's what keeps us in resistance. It's what creates the conservative movement. It, it's yeah. what, you know, we're going to stay back there, anchor yeah. back yeah. there, go back there instead of, no, no, we got to move forward or the planet's going to die, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Well, and that, um, that, that brings to mind the whole notion of I mean, this to me speaks so much of the notion of forgiveness and repentance in, yeah. in a in a combined movement because it's always a both and like yeah. forgiveness and repentance involve both an outward and an inward um, turn to them. I can't yeah. forgive someone else unless I've forgiven myself. Yeah, and and I can't I can't repent yeah. in myself unless I repent for someone else because we exist I... in the space between ourselves. Yeah, yeah. And so true. And so yeah. there's this, like, that that oh. speaks really strongly to me. It's like, you know, we have such a hard time transcending the time dimension for most of us. But if right. you recognize that time is just the way you experience this in an arbitrary kind of way, like, right. the, for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. So that when there's, when there's disintegration that happens way back in the past, mm -hmm. of course it impacts me now to the degree that it has not been repented yeah. and forgiven right yeah. and i don't mean some kind of like falling down before an old man in the sky kind of repentance i mean like how do i afford integration for this way in which there is suffering moving through time yeah yeah and that's that's beautiful well and it's and this is where i go back to carl jung when he said no one comes to consciousness without suffering and yeah it's, it's suffering that leads us there and it's suffering that's led me to every place i've ever i've come including the space i'm sitting in right now you know, and sometimes more suffering than I, than I wish it existed because it affected other people so much, but you're right. You have to forgive yourself for it too. It's a place forgiveness is, I think less something you do and more place that you arrive at, you know, mm. 
but it's 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 an important journey because that's a psychological component. It's it's something that looks back at from where you've come and then says, now we have to deal, we have to organize this on this plane. Yeah. And forgiveness is one way of doing that in a beautiful way that can help give rise to something new. And that's that's what I'm looking to create in my life now. You know, even that, you know, when you showed that book, you know, the guy that wrote that book's not me. Sure. You know, it was yeah, me. Yeah. You know? And it's, it, was, it was eight years ago. <laughs> it's not me anymore. So, you know, and and books are funny because they are they're markers, right? They're markers about your life. And I look back at it and I love that guy. Yeah. I really I, I do. I love him. I have a lot of compassion for him and about what he's about to experience, you know. And I'm glad he did what he did because it's helped a lot of people. Yeah. Um, but I still wish I could go back and maybe smack him, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. So. The, 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 the challenge of forgiving your past selves is always an interesting. Yeah. It's a tough one, especially when there's so many people that are so angry with you about it and you have to forgive yourself and be able to go, I can't control what other people see yeah. and do, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. It's a tough one, man. But that's a whole nother conversation. <laughs> well, thank you so much for, for coming and talking. I have Absolutely. enjoyed it a lot. And appreciate you and um, your willingness to do hard things and your courage. You're someone who we all have our journeys and we all have uh, positives and negatives and different perspectives that we see things, but uh, courage and, and, and a real, a real love for the goodness of being are beautiful qualities. And I feel like you really exemplify those. So thank you. Yeah. Thank you, man. I appreciate that. You know, it's, that's the key to the whole thing is you got to, you're going to talk about this stuff. You got to do it first, you know, and it's not an easy thing, you know, cause yeah. we gotta, be, we gotta be the tip of the sword, you know, yeah. so, and do it always. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Ken. I really appreciate it, man. Yes. Thanks for coming on.